Hit number 180. Wake the immortal strength 
wonderful story of love. Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love. For all the pure and blessed, rest in those mansions above us, with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus, wonderful story of love. preaching tonight, I will try it tonight, but something about a microphone dangling from my ear doesn't excite me, I don't know what it is. Go ahead and take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Book of Judges, Book of Judges chapter 6, we're going to pray one more time, but Book of Judges chapter 6, I appreciate that song they sang, amen, because it helps to know in this world that you know the master of the wind, amen. It's kind of needed, is it not, to know the master of the wind. That's a little bit what we want to talk about this morning in kind of a different kind of way. But Judges chapter 6, and uh, go ahead and stand with me if you would. We'll have a prayer. We're going to read a few verses, and I'll let you sit down. If you can't stand up, I understand that. So I won't hold it against anybody. I know things happen in life that prevent us from doing everything we want to. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once more, God, for this time we have. God, we would thank you for your word. God, it is true and it's pure and it's powerful and it's sharpening a two-edged sword, Father. But 
God, this morning we ask that you do just that, Lord. You take your sword, Father, and you do surgery in our hearts, Lord, that we may grow closer to you, God. Father, we know this is about you this morning, God. It's not about me. God, it's about you and what you can do, Lord. I, I can't help nobody but your spirit, your hand, Father, and your love can, Lord. God, I, I just desire that we get a closer walk with you this morning, Lord. So, God, we ask you just guide us and feed us, Father God. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. If you would, I'll read out loud. If you can just follow along, I'm going to read verses. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 6 in Judges chapter 6. Everybody's there, amen? amen? It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because Midianites and the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midians came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they camped up against and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till they all came to Gaza, unto le and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for the multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. You may be seated. This is a common story when you go through the Old Testament. It's like over and over and over again, you see the same title when you start reading the Word of God. I, I've learned this. When I was in high school, I hated school. Anybody understand that? Amen. Sorry, Linda. I did. I hated it. I went to high school and I graduated by the hair of my chinny chin chin, so to speak. And I had a dad who kind of prodded me pretty good. But learning, I'm not bragging about this. Learning comes easier for some people than it does others. Some of us have to work harder at it. Yeah. But I've learned this when I work harder at it, it sticks. Amen, Elena? <laughs> it sticks. And so there's pluses and curses to my learning ability. I, I couldn't stand those people who could read a book and take a test and fly, pass it with flying colors. I'd have to read it 20 times. But I, I tell you something I've learned growing up. Come out of going through high school, then going into college, and you say, well, what are you doing going to college if you hated school? I, I'll be honest with you. College isn't for anybody, but it's where God wanted me to go. And I don't think little or more of you if you went to college. God has different plans for our lives. As a matter of fact, our family has a friend named Everett Ayers. He graduated school with a fifth grade education, never graduated high school, and he's a multimillionaire. So I'm not going to bash people, amen? But um, I tell you something I learned is punctuation is important, amen? I stood the other day, we got a garden growing, and Leo and Linda have helped us a lot with this garden. But we have a garden growing, and um, our corn is turning yellow on the bottom leaves. Leo said, get some nitrogen, and... And Mrs. Butler over here said, I could have told you that. You need nitrogen. And everybody keeps saying, you need nitrogen. So I went to find some nitrogen. You know, that stuff's not real easy to find. And so I finally checked a couple of stores, ended up at Earl May, and I thought, I'll go to the plant store. You know, the, the nursery where they should know what they're talking about. Amen? I like what Linda just did. She goes, <laughs> and that was my reaction, too. I walked up and I said to the lady, I'm growing corn. You would think in the state of Nebraska, if you walked into a nursery that sells plants, they could help you understand about growing corn, amen? This is Nebraska. And I said to the lady, she goes, can I help you? I said, yes. I said, my corn is turning yellow on the bottom leaves, and I've been told I need nitrogen. I said, what do I need? And she looked at me with a blank stare, and I thought, you just asked me how you could help me. Uh... Uh, let's see here. Um, no, not. You can try this one. No, that the acid would probably eat your plants up. I went, huh? <laughs> and she, no, that's too much acid in there. I don't know if that's that's too much nitrogen. That's uh, you know. Let me go ask somebody in the back. And so while she was in the back getting lost, I found a gardening book, and I started reading it. And I, I learned this. 
the index that was way off. It said corn was on page 32. On the page 32, I learned how to grow beans. <laughs> My point is this. I'll tell you, grammar and punctuation and putting things in the right order, amen, are important. The corn was in the wrong page. The publisher had messed up. She came back out and she said, uh, well, uh, you should try this one. And I read the back and it says, do not let it fall on the leaves of your plants because it is not good. Plant it three to six inches under the soil. And I said, ma'am, my garden is already planted. Well, this is the one I recommend for you. Anyhow, I took it, went home, and spent that night on my knees at 10 o'clock at night pulling up weeds and putting fertilizer in my garden. So what's the point of all that? It, it's just fun to talk about life sometimes. But my point is this, is I picked that book up, and as I tried to read this garden book, and I'll be honest, it was a messed up book. It, the publishing was wrong. Whoever did the editing, the grammar was wrong, the page order was off. It was just one of those books that was messed up. It made me appreciate this about the Word of God. It's an order, amen? And I can sit here, and I can look something up. It, it, it's, it's all there, amen? The solutions, everything I need to do, they're all there. And I got on my knees, me and Jennifer in that garden, and I think I pulled probably 100 pounds of weeds on Friday night. I was in there in the dark, so was she. The pregnant lady was on her knees. I'll tell you, I, I watched Jennifer on her knees, and I was thankful for a pregnant wife who didn't give up on working. She just kept plugging away. We were on our knees, and she got up and walked away, and I'm, I'm pulling the weeds up in this garden, and I'm just, I thought, man, will this never end? And I kept pulling on I mean, Don't neglect your garden for a couple weeks. Let me just say that. So I pulled these weeds up, and there was places where these weeds would actually grow right at the base of the plants. You know what I'm talking about? Because they know where the food's at. And they're going to steal the nutrients from that plant. And I sat there, and I marveled. I thought, man, boy, we, we need to take heed to the Word of God, because God gives evidence of the Word of God in nature in many ways. Man, it's important to keep the weeds out of the garden, Amen. Because once, listen, I learned this, once they start growing through some weeds, you won't be able to remove without killing the plants. And I understand more so when Jesus tells them, let them grow together, amen? And there's going to be a time to come, he goes, well, I'll pull them up together, and I'll separate them myself. But Judges chapter 6, and a lot of people know this story, I'm going to pull this together here, and it says, and the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. I'm not going to read that whole thing together, but God, the first thing God points out in this book of Judges is, the children of Israel did evil again. Now, I can raise my hand and say I understand that life. How about you? So, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Then you're a liar, so you did do evil again. <laughs> Listen, we're sinners, amen? It was passed on through Adam, went through the bloodline, and whether you think it or not, it's in your blood, amen? From the day you're born. It says, but they did evil on the side of the Lord. It says, and the sec verse 2 says, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of Midianites and the children of Israel made themselves dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So the children of Israel, in some form or another that we know right here, have done evil in the sight of God. Not in the sight of man, but in the sight of God. They've somehow disobeyed God, and as a result of that, they're, they're living like criminals. They're on a constant run. We know here they're living in caves and rocks and strongholds. And as we read down against them, they can't win. And so much to the point that whatever they've done, now the enemy has come up against them in their life. And it doesn't matter what they do, they can't get it done. We, as we read through there, if you look, they planted and they try to grow plants. They try the garden. And when they would grow plants, the enemies would come and they would take or destroy their plants. So that's not a big deal. They still got animals. Yeah, but if you don't have agriculture, how do you feed your animals? True? If you can't grow the grass, how are you going to feed your goats? Amen? Do you not have to have feet? So this in addition to the impact of plants, it did impact their animals, which impacted their lifestyle. They got milk from the goats. They got meat from their animals. So whatever it is they've done, it's had a dramatic impact upon everything in their life. And the fact that they had to hide, we know it's not right. So drop down to verse 7. It's like you just couldn't get ahead. Any ever feel like that? doesn't matter how hard you work or what you did, you can't get ahead. That's how I feel like in the garden the other night. It's like I can't win this battle. Burn it all. Verse 7. Jennifer, is she here? I hope she didn't hear that. And it came to pass that when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, 
because of the Midianites. Now listen, they're crying unto the Lord because of the Midianites. They're not crying unto God because of their sin. They're not. They're, they're saying, God, these people are a nuisance to us, Lord. We can't get ahead. And Lord, they're causing problems in our life. I, I, I've had people like that in my life. Anybody else? Forget it. <laughs> and verse 8, it says, And the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you, in verse 9, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hands of all that oppressed you. And I dragged them out from, from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord, your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites, and who, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Do you understand that the children of Israel, remember they were in Egypt, we all know that. God used Moses to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. They went to the wilderness, and they spent quite a few years in that wilderness, not because God wanted them to stay there, but because of their sin, amen? It really wasn't that far of a journey if you stay it out. But 40 years in the wilderness, God has grace and mercy and delivers them out of the wilderness. God brings them into the promised land, the land of God, a promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey, the land that they should be able to grow crops and animals and have no problems. But God gave them some instructions before they went to that land. Amen? He said, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Remember that one? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. I, I can tell you, that's a hard one nowadays. There's a lot of distractions in this world, is there not? There is. So let's be honest. It's hard. You give the world an inch, it will take a mile. Amen? This is true. So here they are. They're in bondage because of their sin. They have forsaken God. They're trying to live the life they're known the lifestyle. And I, I, I like how Brother Miser said this. He goes, so... How's that working for you? How's that working for you, children of Israel? I, I gave you everything you needed, and you disobeyed me, and things were falling apart. How's that working for you? How are things going? And we know it's not. In the bottom of verse 10, he says, but ye have not obeyed my voice. God reminds them of what their sin was, Amen. Let me you know, learn about God. When John Patterson has problems and he can't figure out what's going on, and I go back to God, I can tell you this. Before God gives me any kind of solution, God shows me what the problem is. Amen? you got to fix the problem before we can solve everything. Amen? And verse 11 says, And there came an angel of the Lord, and this is one of my favorite parts, and said unto the oak, which is no pride, that pertained unto Joash, the Ezbrite, and his son Gideon, threshed by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So here we have the young man Gideon, and we know this story. I hope we do. And Gideon's over here, and he's hiding behind the wine press, doing his work. Now, let me just say, that should tell you of their lifestyle and their mindset. They are living in fear. He is farming behind the wine press so the enemy can't see him because they know if the enemy knows or sees his crops, they're going to come and destroy what he has. Amen? It's what the Bible says. The enemy is destroying what they have. They can't get ahead. So the angel Lord appears in the Gideon. I love the man Gideon in the Bible. I'll tell you why for a reason. And verse 12 says, And the angel Lord appeared unto Gideon and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, Listen to this. Why is all this befalling us? And where be all the miracles, listen, which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianites. Let me just say this. I believe Gideon had a right upbringing. So what makes you say that? First of all, the angel Lord could have went to anybody, but he goes to Gideon and calls him, number one, a mighty man of valor. 
And God wants to use Gideon to deliver the children of Israel. And Gideon can't get over this. And Gideon asks the angel and says, I don't understand, Lord. Why does all this happen to us? And he said, Lord, what, what happened? When I was growing up, I was told all these stories of this great, powerful God who would deliver his people. I was told about these miracles, about this God who did the impossible things. And he's talking to the angel. He wants to know what is going on. So God explains it to them. In verse 14, it says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And now God says, Gideon, I want to use you to do that. And he said unto him, O my Lord, where shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manassas, and I am the least of my father's house. Let me tell you something I want to point about Gideon and I respect about the man. He wasn't arrogant. Amen. He was a very humble young man from what we can see. Amen. He didn't say, oh, Lord, you got the right man for the job. God, we can do this. That wasn't Gideon's response. Gideon's going, Lord, I think you've got the wrong guy here. Listen, that's a rare quality in the day we live in, is it not? It's a rare quality. Yes, this is a quality, amen? The Bible says, by the fear and humility of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. The eight, seven things that the Lord hates, and God hates a proud look. Gideon was a humble man, amen? So we can see more why God chose to use a man, Gideon. I love to be around humble people. I, I'm not saying I'm something, but I enjoy being around humble people. There's something peaceful about humble people. You know what I'm saying? I've said this before. I know preachers that when I get around them, they're very quiet. They're not look at me. They're just very quiet. And they're, you know, I walk up to certain preachers. They ask them a question. They don't say, well, this is how I fixed it. I know one particular will say, you know, John, let me tell you what God says about that, what he did in my life. There's a value on humble people. But God's going to use this man, Gideon, who doesn't think much of himself to do something. He says he's at least in his father's house in the bottom of verse 15. In this 16, the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. I would definitely turn to God if I was Gideon and say, Lord, they're like grasshoppers, and you're going to use me to smite them as one man. God, I think you got the wrong person. In verse 17, and he said unto him, this is Gideon, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Let me just say this. The name Gideon has been under much scrutiny in the world. Because we get to the point where Gideon starts asking God to wet a fleece and keep the land dry, or to keep the land dry and wet a fleece. And people said, well, Gideon was wrong for doing that. Gideon was wrong for asking God for signs. You know, God doesn't sit here and preach on the fact that Gideon, you're the wrong guy. Gideon was scared is what he was, amen? How could this be? In verse 18, it says this. He said, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry here until thou come. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid. That's a go, if you don't know. And an eleven cakes of an ephel of flour... And the flesh he put in a basket, and he put broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. Do uh, you realize what Gideon is doing? These things that Gideon is bringing before his angel are a very precious commodity to the children of Israel. Remember, they can't grow nothing. They can't get ahead. Because every time they try to grow something, their agriculture fails. Because the enemy keeps destroying it. They're living in caves and rocks. So for a man to come and sacrifice his food to a what we might call a stranger, listen, this is a great sacrifice, amen? Is it not? In verse 20, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh of unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so, getting his obedience. Then the angel of the Lord put, out, put forth the end of the staff, that was in his hand, and touched 
the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. I want to point something out very important here. Look at verse 23. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, for thou shalt not die. Let me just point this out. Gideon had fear and respect for who God was. We need to understand this. Because if you study the Old Testament, number one, we know with Moses, though no man has seen God. And if he did see God, it was known that he would die because God is holy. Now Gideon realizes this is an angel, Lord. This is God speaking to him. And Gideon realizes, I'm going to die because I have seen a holy God. God consumes his fire. God, listen, Gideon's seen the miracles that he heard talk about. The angel pours the staff on fire. He goes, and consumes the food. Now, I don't know about you, but if it was me, I would have stepped back and reevaluated the situation and said, what's going on here? There's something different going on here. I've never seen this before. Gain some respect from Gideon. In 24, Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Ark for the, of the Abzites. And it came to pass some night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bull off. Now listen to what he's asking him to do here. Listen to what God is asking Gideon to do. Take thy father's young bull off, even the second bull off is seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. God is now asking Gideon to do some very serious and hard things. Remember, the agriculture is important, amen? The animals are important because they don't have much. And now God wants Gideon to take his father's animals and cut down, tear down the altar bell, cut down the grove of trees. Listen, these are valuable commodities. I was raised in the Midwest in Oregon. Trees are valuable out there. We think trees are neat here. I cringe when I see people cut trees down in Nebraska. I about cry. But in the Midwest, that is their lifestyle, amen? That is the economy, is lumber. And here it's very important, too. So now Gideon is supposed to take his father's animals, cut down the trees, and give a sacrifice unto God. And I, can't, I would think if I was Gideon, I'd be going, Lord, are you sure this is not what I think is a good idea? It's probably what I would say. This stuff is kind of important, and you want me to just burn it? God wants Gideon to restore some things, amen? Let me tell you about the altar of Baal. God, we now see God bring up the altar. We, we now find out in this verse where the children of Israel have been worshiping. We now we will see where their hearts are at. We will see the foundation of the problem. Let me, I, I did some... Some internet searching on Baal. I, there's, listen, Baal is a very general word in the Word of God. It can be used in many contexts and application, but in every context, it has a specific meaning and definition. In this particular case, the Baal here, we'll see this later on, it's the Phoenician god Baal. We'll find this later on in the context. When, <coughs> when specific of the Phoenician god or king like god known as Baal is being referred to, it is a weather or storm god were characterized with very similar to the Israelite god Yahweh. Philil of Bibios associated Baal closely with Zeus, and he often appears under the name of Baal Shaman, which means the Lord of Heaven. Because of the close connection between rainfall and agriculture fertility, being a rain god meant that Baal was also associated with fertility in general. He was ultimately responsible for the crops doing well. Listen to this for the production of offspring of domesticated animals, and of course, of people bearing children. In this specific context, the word Baal is a Baal, he's a god of what we might call Mother Nature. Interesting, huh? He's a god that people pray to to have their crops grown, and to have their animals reproduced, and they even went to this god for the bearing of children. They've come a long ways from where God started them, have they not? This is, listen, this is flat out wicked. We should be saying amen to this, amen. This is evil. 
They have turned their hearts from the true and living God, and they're serving, so to speak, the gods of Mother Nature, and they're getting down, and they're praying to, to this altar, this God, that, listen, their God will make their crops be more productive, would make their animals grow, and make life be good. And listen, to this, it didn't matter how much they prayed to their God, listen, to, and their crops would grow, and God would come along and say, but watch this. You can pray all you want, but I'm going to bring an enemy who's going to destroy those crops. And do you think the children of Israel would have said, something's missing here? Yeah, our crops are growing now. But as soon as they grow, another force comes in and destroys our crops. It's good to stop and think about life, amen? And what's going on in your life, amen? And say, what's the problem here? Am I doing something wrong? Is God in the equation? See, it didn't matter what God they had before them. And what they did, or what they listen to me. Let me just tell you something. This is demonic. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, amen, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. You want to understand this? This wasn't just something that they prayed to. This was demonic. This was wicked. And this was witchcraft. Amen. It was. So you're mad. No, I'm not mad. But listen to me. There, there's this thing the Bible calls higher ground in the spiritual life of a Christian. It's called a walk with God. It is high. It's elevated above the world. It's a life that God blesses and God prospers. And they didn't have that life. Because without realizing it, they were worshiping Satan. If you take the name Baal and you go through the word study in the Baal, we actually get the name Baal is deserved from the name Beelzebub. Interesting, huh? So how do we know that they were the only worship tip? We don't. We know this. They were disobeying God, so therefore they were following the footprints of Satan. And it didn't matter how many times they paid the bill, and that corn could have grown 10 foot tall for them. God came along and had to destroy it. Isn't that an amazing thought? I'm just, I, I, if I get everybody just to think about that. No matter what their God do, they couldn't overcome the real God. And this is this is serious stuff here, people. God says, Gideon, I want to use you. Gideon says, I'm a nobody. Man, God uses nobodies, amen. amen. I, I gotta say this. Craig Henry's got a son. He's got many sons. <laughs> I, I I miss Noah. I I, I miss I, I miss the he's really quiet at church. If I understand when he gets home, he's not so quiet. If I understand he's a quite the What's a good word? Joster? Yeah. But I gotta tell you, I, I somebody's been mad at me and say, oh, well, why are you singing on Noah? I, there's there's just something about Noah. When I get around him talking, he's very quiet. I know that's not always normal. But I gotta appreciate his humility in many ways. And I say to myself, that's the kind of person God can use. I do. Man, God chose Gideon because he was a humble man. And Gideon had been raised up right. He understood who the God of his fathers were. He had heard about the miracles. Somebody had spent some time and invested some Bible into Gideon. And these things were all in Gideon's life, even through the bad times. I wonder why God chose Gideon. So now they're worshiping the Phoenician god Baal. And it doesn't matter how much they prayed, how high their faith grew, God caused those things to be destroyed. Then God says, Gideon, I want you to destroy your father's altar. Gideon, I want you to destroy the altar of Baal, Gideon. And I want you to cut down the trees. Gideon, I want you to use these commodities, which your people value as, as valuable. And Gideon, I want you to tear them down and burn them. And the animal. And here, it's going to come to a head here. And I like this. In verse 29, go there if you would. It says, and they said one to another, who hath done this thing? So they wake up the next morning. That night the Bible says Gideon goes, get some guys, and they tear down the altar bell. They cut down the grove trees. They take some cattle, and they burn a sacrifice into the real God. Do you see what God is doing here? God is taking this ship that was going the wrong direction, and he's turning the helm of the ship. 
And he's trying to get this ship back on the right path. You ever try to drive a boat against the waves? Huh? It's not real easy now, is it? I've been out in the ocean in storms, and I don't want to do it again. But I've been about 55 miles out. Brother Butler's been in the Navy, and good for him. Amen. But the ocean is not my thing. And I remember we got out there one time. We're in a boat. We're in a modern-day boat. It had two 500-horsepower Caterpillar engines in this boat. It was about a 48-foot-long boat. You should be going, oh, yeah. The captain would throw it on the engine. You can just feel the horsepower. It had been a lot like a PT boat or something. I mean, it was just phenomenal. But we would come up, and we were going out to 50 miles out in the ocean. As we were going out, the storms come in. And we got about 14 to 16-foot swells. And that might not seem like a lot, but that's a lot. I remember that boat would come up on top of the wave, and literally, I was in the wood house with the captain, and you could look down, it was like a cliff. Then that whole boat would just tip like this, like on a cliff. And pretty soon, the whole boat is almost vertical down, and you're looking down the bottom of this hole in the ocean. Made your hair stand up. <coughs> and the bad part was, there was nowhere you could go on the boat to get away from it. I don't know, you come up the side, and that boat would just fall to the bottom. You hit the bottom, splash it out, then he would throw all up and climb out of the next hole. That leaves an impression upon you. But I do know this. It took a lot of horsepower to drive against that storm. They didn't have that kind of horsepower back then. Do you understand what I'm saying? You ever try to go against a storm? It's amazing to me if man hasn't figured this out. Every time man thinks they've invented the biggest and greatest and most wicked thing, God comes along and snaps his finger with a swoosh. Let me show you what I can do. Let me show what an F5 tornado looks like. Try stopping that one. That's honestly what I think. I'm getting off track. We'll shoot that rabbit and get away from there. So Gideon, he tears down the altar, builds a sacrifice unto God. You understand, things are getting put back the way they should be. It says, and the men said to one another, who hath done this thing? They wake up and they get ready to go about their daily routines and worship, and they get ready to go to the altar to Baal, maybe, and they look and say, where's the altar at? It's gone. And the trees are cut down, too. And somebody has killed cattle. We need to kill this man. So what? It's what it says here. <coughs> In verse 30, And the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son. Man, he had to talk about a father who's got to be scared. That he may die. This was serious to them. This, I mean, this just tells you how heavily their hearts were in this. They were going to kill a man for tearing down the altar of Baal. Bring out Joash, bring out the son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, I love this, a father who has wisdom, amen, and I believe this came from God. Listen to this. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, the people who wanted to kill us then, will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he be a God, let him plead for himself. And I say amen. Let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. And Joash said this, if Baal really is God, if he really is a God that he should be, I'll tell you what, don't worry about Gideon. Let Baal take care of Gideon. There's some wisdom in that, amen? I'll tell you what, Joash just saved Gideon's life, amen? Because that wisdom that Joash just spoke, it came from God. Because Joash understood this, because obviously somebody told Gideon about the miracles. We wonder where that came from. Obviously that was taught to him by his family. And Joash stood up and said, this is Baal's all that good. He's such a great God. Let him kill him. Let's stand back and watch. I love it. I'm sure the men in the city had to stop, and all of a sudden something clicks in their mind and says, wait a second, this makes sense. This actually makes sense. I think things are actually starting to make sense pure in their life. Listen, Joash understood who God was. I love this part. 32, therefore on that day, he called him Drevel. You understand what Drevel means? It means the opposer 
of Baal. On that day they called him trouble, saying, Let us plead against him, because he hath thrown down. Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Apparently, Baal couldn't get the job done, amen? Apparently, Baal couldn't do it, amen? Because it didn't happen, and so much of the point when it didn't happen, they said, it's time to give Gideon a new name, amen? It's time, let's rename this guy, because there's something different about him. So they named him Jeroboam, which means opposer of Baal. In 33, it says, Then all the Midianites and Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over against and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. And here's a good word here. But, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet with Ebezer, was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout Manassas, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulon, and unto Nephtali, and they came up to meet them. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if it do not be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. And let me give that modern English. It happened. And it was so on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed out the dew of the fleece, a bowl of full water. I love that part that God puts in there, a bowl of full water. Listen, if God's going to tell you something, you're not going to question it, amen? God says, I'm going to soak this thing. That way there ain't no questioning. A bowl full of water. In 39, and Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry upon the fleece, and upon the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. I'm not going to finish this story. I will kind of give you a little recap if you don't know. If you know the rest of the story, get in and now have some restored confidence that, hey, God's hand is upon this. Gideon has seen those miracles that he was taught growing up. So Gideon goes forward from here, and he assembles himself an army, to paraphrase it. And he gets them quite a few men, and God comes up to Gideon, and God says, Gideon, you got too many guys for this battle. I love the story. You need to get rid of some. Gideon didn't stand there and argue with God. Let me just tell you that. If you want to read on, you're welcome to. But Gideon didn't stand there and argue with God for a couple hours. Gideon obeyed God. And Gideon weaned out his army, and God came back and said, Gideon, you still have too many men to fight this battle. Do you understand how big the enemy was? God says they're like the sand of the sea and like the grasshoppers, insomuch that no man could number them. That's how big the enemy was. And God's telling Gideon, you got too many guys. And Gideon thins out his armies, I believe, three times. And he goes at it with 300 men. And a conventional warfare says, bust out the machine guns or get as many swords as you can. And God said, Gideon, this is not how we're going to do this. Gideon, I want you to take some pots. If God told me to take a pot to go to war, I would have, honestly, I would have questioned God. You want me to take a pot to war, God? But Gideon didn't. Gideon took the pot, and God told Gideon and his men to take lamps. And they were to put those lamps inside the pots. And the Bible says that Gideon's men came up one night, and they camped around the enemy. And they put that pot, that lamps in their pots. And what a phenomenal battle strategy. Every time I read this, I wonder, somebody should try this today. I don't know, seriously. It would make some grown men cry. What a great battle strategy. And they stood out there in an ark, and all of a sudden Gideon says, When I say so, you yell out the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and you break those pots. And could you imagine me in your tent that night down in that valley? And all of a sudden you hear these men scream, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And they break the pots and all of a sudden these lights just come out of nowhere like that. I would probably just die of a heart attack. And Gideon and his men didn't have to lift a finger to slay a man. Because God said this, Gideon, I want to show you one of those miracles that you were told about, Gideon. Yeah, I'm going to show you who I am. Because I haven't changed, Gideon. I'm still that God. 
I would have been there that day and watched this great event happen. Let's back up in the story and close out with this. A couple things I want to point out in the story. First thing God points out to the children of Israel. You remember the children of Israel saw they had problems, amen? They're living in caves and rocks and they couldn't even prosper. And they finally cry out to God. The Bible says they had an evil again inside the Lord. They cry out to God. And the first thing that God does to them is he points out their sin. Listen, before the fellowship relationship can be restored, the sin, amen, had to be dealt with. And God says, we need to fix the problem before we can restore the relationship. Listen, you don't see two guys getting a fist fight and stand up and say, hey, let's go get a hamburger together. <coughs> I don't think I've ever seen that. It doesn't work that way. No, God pointed out the sin, and we know what the sin was, that they had disobeyed God in the promised land, in a place where they, listen, you know, let me just, I'm going to say this. You understand, they disobeyed God in the promised land. This day, they disobeyed God in God's will. They were where they were supposed to be in life. They had come through the wilderness. They were in the promised land. And they sinned. Well, in God's will. And what God had put the, where God had put them. You understand that? Well, I'm in God's will, you know. How can I go wrong? You can't, Amen. I go to the church. So, how's your life with God? Amen. What's the point of coming to church if you don't have a relationship with God? Amen. What is the point in that? God first points out their sin. The next thing God does, God tells Gideon, we need to destroy the sin. You understand? Gideon didn't say, okay, guys. Let's take the altar, we're going to take it apart piece by piece, and we're going to move it into a different land and set it back up. That way, everybody will be happy. No, God said, Gideon, I want you to tear down and destroy it. Amen? Gideon, no, I want you to destroy it. Gideon, I want you to take your father's, father's valuable cattle and put it upon a new altar and offer sacrifice unto God. Listen to this. Not only did he destroy the altar, he wrecked a new altar to God. Then he gave to God the most valuable and precious thing that they had in their name, and that was their cattle. Listen, God demands our best, amen? God wants to be number one in our lives, amen? Listen, to go after God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind means to give God your best, amen? God's not in the being second, amen, and we know that from the story. Listen, after Gideon built the altar and they restored the sacrifice, the sacrificial system was important in the Old Testament. After they restored the sacrificial system, you know what happens next? God gives deliverance unto the children of Israel. They got rid of the sin. God pointed out the sin. They got rid of the sin. They restored the fellowship through sacrifice, and then God delivered them out of the hand of their enemies. That is the order of events. In every story in the Word of God. So where does that put us today would be the question. I, I, when I read about Baal, and the kind of God that Baal was, is God of fertility, I'll be honest, you know what I said to myself? I just said in the office, I thought, and they say the Word of God is not relevant today. It's very relevant, is it not? Man, we live in a culture, we live in an economy where people are fearful over the weather, over their crops and how well their crops do. Because if their crops do well, do well, they won't have the money to proceed in life. And they live in fear. And there's people out there that hug trees and they worship Mother Nature. Do they not? Where I come from, people love the trees. When they call them tree huggers, believe it or not, instead of Oregon, they really go out and hug trees. They're, listen, you laugh, but they're sick in the head because of sin. I would say this is very relevant today. Amen, Evelyn? This is very relevant. Would you not say that? And there's farmers out there worship their crops. But to make this relevant, I would say this to you. Does this apply to your life? Amen? Would you stand with me if you would? I'm going to have Jennifer come forward. If God's word wasn't relevant, he wouldn't give it to us today, amen.
I'm not going to tell you, as I study this chapter in this, of Gideon, I had to get down on my knees before God and say, Lord, there are some things there that are hindering my relationship with you, God. There are some things, God, that I put first in my life, and I know that's why this is going wrong. I know why this is not what it should be. God, there are some things there. And let me tell you, that's the very same thing with Gideon. They had to get rid of the sin. They had to tear down the altar of Baal before the relationship could be restored. Amen. I don't know who doesn't want an almighty God acting in their life, amen, on their behalf, and fighting their battles for them. I don't know who doesn't want that. But I tell you, that did not come until they got rid of that which shouldn't be there. They got rid of Baal. Baal carried many forms in the word of God, not just this God of fertility. Baal was worshipped as a way a man turned his heart to God and he focused on something that was not pertaining to God. A little bit different invitation. If you just close your eyes this morning, as Jennifer just plays a song, and we're going to leave this altar open. I don't use the word altar flippantly right now. Because the altar was that place you came to have fellowship and to restore relationships with God. Amen. Last night I sat next to my son's bed and I was tired. I was very tired. And I'm not for sorry. You can feel sorry for me. But Isaac said to me, Dad, are we going to read the Bible? We got a little game we play. I read the Bible. I ask questions. They get stars. They get actually little stickers they put on a chart. And I tell them, whoever gets the most, daddy's going to go and do something fun with them. And I kind of had to rethink that a little bit. But I remember we were talking about John the Baptist and the preacher. And if you ask Isaac who John the Baptist was, he'll tell you who the preacher was. And then we talked about Satan. And I asked Isaac, who was that, that angel? And Isaac said, I said, what was his name? He said, Sin. He said, no, his name was Satan. Whisper. It was, but he was Sin. Amen. And I said to my son, Isaac, the Bible says all liars and all adulterers and all whoremakers shall have their heart in the lake that burns fire and brimstone. I said, Isaac, there's a price for sin. I said, God doesn't like it when you sin. And God says, Isaac, that when somebody's a sinner and they don't have Jesus in their life, basically when they're worshiping at the Isle of Sin, at the God of Sin, God says they're going to die and they're going to go to hell, Isaac. Can I tell you, this kind of scared me as I was telling my son. And I said, Isaac, the Bible says hell is a great gulf. That when you go there, Listen to me. That when you go there, you can't get out. And I thought to myself, I have a beautiful voice in this room. And if I don't get before God, ask God to save their souls and do something in their life, they're going to go there one day. And maybe stop and reevaluate my life. And where I'm worshiping at. And what my children are watching. And it's what I'm doing going to draw them to that God that can save their souls. And as I told him last night, he got quiet. No, he didn't ask Jesus Christ to save him last night. But he heard it. And he listened. I can't make that choice for him. I believe with all my heart. And I mean this in a loving way. There are people in this room right now who will die one day. And the Bible says they will go to a place called hell because of the sin in their life. And it's a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The darkest fire is black. The hottest fire is black. I mean, I told Isaac, when you go there, you'll hear people scream because they're burning. And they can't stop burning because they made a choice in their life that they would fall sin and not God.
This is serious, people. I would not want one person to walk out of this building today and die and go to hell. Listen, I just got done reading through the book of Revelation. And the more I read through it, and the more I see the events of this world today, I'm telling you what, the book is true. You can read the book and you can see everything going on, and it's happening. We're cruising through that book at a good pace right now in life. And you get towards the end, and there's two books in the book of Revelation. We have the book of life, and we have the Lamb's book of life. One book represents that everybody's born on this earth. And the other book represents those who are going to heaven. And their names are written in that book because one day they got down and they said, God, I understand something, that I'm a sinner. And that God, your son does not save me and forgive me. God, I understand that your son died for my sins on that cross. God said that they don't get down and acknowledge it, that Jesus is the Savior and that Baal is not the Savior, but the true living God is. And acknowledge that and accept that and turn from their wicked ways. The Bible says you're going to that lake. This is not a game. Oh, my heart goes out and I pray we get back to the day in our country where preachers get up from the pulpit and they preach about hell. And then when we walk out this door, we realize that people are going to hell in this town. And they're going to hell in Elm Creek and Oxford, Orleans, Grand Island. They're going to hell. And I can't help but think that God has left us here as Christians to reach those. That that is to be our priority in life. But for those of you not Christians tonight, let me tell you this. God says because you're seeing you're going to hell. You say that's mean. No, it's not mean. Let me tell you why it's not me. God says, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, yes, there is a price you have to pay for your sinful life. That sin nature comes from Adam. He says, but there's a gift you can take, and it's free, amen. The gift of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the altar is open. Maybe you need to come and there's somebody you need to pray for. Or maybe you say, John, I can relate to Gideon's life. Because I tell you, with my relationship with God is gone and I don't know what happened, but I think I know how. That my heart is worshiping at the wrong altar. And as hard as I try, as much as I go there, I can't seem to get ahead. Listen, this message is for you. Maybe you should come forward, God. I kind of feel my life drifting a little bit. Would you just keep me from going down that road, Lord? Satan desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat, the Bible says. We all fall under a category. The altar's open. You're welcome to come. We'll just keep this going for a few more minutes. And then we're going to close. I'm thankful I have parents taught me of the miracles of God. Not only taught me, they showed me what God does in their life. I'm thankful for parents who did that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, I want to thank you for your word, Father. God, I want to thank you for your son who died for me, Father. And when I was six years old, Lord, I got down. And that, God, I asked him to forgive me for my sinfulness. And that, God, he came in and he saved me, Father. God, I want to thank you for that love you bestowed upon my life. God, I want to thank you for your word and your road map we stand before today, Father. God, I ask that we not forget the story of Gideon, Father. Lord, it is a story to deliver man from his wrong path. 
God, we thank you for this, Lord. We ask today, Lord, you protect us. But God, I pray for the one here who might be struggling with salvation. And God, I know that it's not a fun struggle because I've been down that road. God, I pray, Lord, that they would just say, you know what, I'm not going to fight this anymore. And they would just say, God, I'm going to let you fight this battle. Lord, I'm going to give my life on you. Be my Savior. Forgive me for my sins. God, we want to thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We pray for pastor. You heal him, Father. It's in Jesus' name we do pray.